Uh oh, here comes Craig. Stop talking about it. Stop Craig. talking about me. Stop talking. Stop talking about me. <laughs> Stop talking is a think like negotiator strategy. <laughs> oh, yeah. yes. What is it? The first one who talks loses? Well, I don't, I don't like to say loses. I like to say he or she who talks next concedes in the negotiation. Uh, and, I, I just keep your mouth shut. During yeah. Elegantly put. <laughs> look, yeah. how many, look how many people are on. <laughs> well. Look how many people are on this call today. All right, so I'm going to talk for about five minutes before because I just have, I am on fire right now. I just came back from a, um, from a um, networking meeting with uh, Tim Gillette was there uh, at Success North Dallas. I am, this is why I love live. I love live events. So I am on fire right now. There were 180 people in the room. Not, not one person was wearing a mask. I washed my hands a hundred times, but um, it was really interesting what happened today. Um, so I go to this networking meeting. There's a great speaker. He's an ex-Navy commander, and he's talking about uh, how he was uh, a top gun, um, top gun guy, uh, a fighter pilot, and how he relates, you know, from the co cockpit, how he relates it to business, how he relates everything to business, and what he learned as a Navy commander, how he relates it to business, and he's a great speaker. So after he speaks, you know, this, uh, this is an hour and a half networking event. There's a, um, the LPGA golf tour, the women's golf tour is coming to literally my backyard. It's old American golf course where I live. I live on the golf course. I live on the second hole. The women's professional golf tour is coming here on that uh, June 30th to um, July 4th. So it's a big, big deal here uh, in um, where we live. There's already a big buzz going on. So anyway, at this networking event this morning, hey guys, can you all mute yourselves um, if you're not, uh, not talking right now? So anyway, so at this networking event, they auction off a pro-am. So basically they auction off a slot to play with a woman pro at this event the day before their tournament starts. It's called a pro-am, professional slash amateur they partner together and there's a tournament, a one day tournament. So these go for like $5,000 in Sherwood country club, where I used to belong in LA, they, uh, they were $10,000. So hey, guys. Yeah. You guys. yeah, no, I really appreciate what you're doing, but it makes me feel better Joanne. that Joanne. you eat. Joanne, the like, mute all button. I, you wouldn't want me to walk away from my food to do something for you that can be done later. Okay, I'm gonna have to mute all. <laughs> so, and I'll uh, bring Glenn back on to ask him to unmute. Guys, just when you come on, just be careful and just mute yourselves. So anyway, so I'm at this event and they're, they're, it's $5,000 normally to play it in the Pro-Am, but they're gonna auction off, they donated one to, uh, to um, um, benefit the Dallas Police Force, the Dallas, uh, Texas Police Force. So the auction starts at $1,000. So $1,000, someone bids, someone bids $1,200, and then I bid $1,500, and the whole room starts looking at me because I bid fifteen hundred, and I won. I won. I, I'm thinking I saved thirty five hundred dollars, and everyone is looking at me like, "Who's the guy that just bid fifteen hundred dollars?" No idea who that guy is, but I now want to meet him. So after the event is over, and ask Tim Gillette, so many people come over to me, and they're, they're like, "So who are you, and what do you do?" And so I sold three exhibitor tables at my event after I bid fifteen hundred dollars. They bought three $800 tables. So right there, I just made my money back and $1,000. My point is, this is what you do. This is what we do. You go to an event, you sponsor it, or you do something where you stand out from everybody else. And I had a line of people, I have so many business cards of uh, people that want to come to my event or sponsor a table. And I just got like a ton of business cards and they were flocking. It was, it was very funny. So anyway, so that just happened today. And I'm very excited about it because in my mind, yes, I spent $1,500, but it was for a charity. So I'm writing a check for $1,500, but it's a charity. So it's a write-off and I'm at a 50% level. So it's really only costing me $750 because I'm getting a write-off for $1,500. And that's the way we have to think when we do business. I stood out from everybody else in the room because I won this uh, thing that I'm even now going to get to play with a professional golfer in my backyard. So then the head of Success North Dallas says, hey, we need to talk. Uh, 
you know, uh, I, I, I got to have you speak at this event. And, and I said, I would love for you to come to my event and speak at my event. So now I think I got a speaking gig at Success North Dallas for at least 200 people, um, hopefully before October, so I can promote my October event. Just wanted to share that. That's A. B, I mentioned this yesterday, but there's more people online today. So I'm going to do a shameless plug for my son, Ryan, the drummer. Uh, so it just it was released yesterday, and now it's uh, they just released the lineup four minutes ago. So if you go to Lollapalooza, you'll see the band. So my son Ryan is the drummer for a new band called Otto. Actually, they're a band that exists already. Otto O T T O O no O T T T O O T T T O uh, three T's. And so Otto is a band that he. Uh, the Thredge band that he's in, one of the members of Otto is in that band, the Metallica bass player's son. To make a really long story short, Otto was asked to play at Lollapalooza. My son is playing drums at Lollapalooza in Chicago on uh, August 1st, the uh, third day of the fourth day of the event. And he's playing in Bottle Rock, another festival on September 4th. And the headliner for Bottle Rock is Guns N' Roses. Guns N' Roses is playing, um, Stevie Nicks is playing Foo Fighters, Billy Eilish, and my son's band, Otto, and, uh, and the others too, there's a bunch of others. So we are on fire in my house right now because my son is playing at Lollapalooza as a drummer and he's playing at Bottle Rock. And as a marketing guy, we are going to blast this to the world. So anyway, so I started today, I'm blasting now to the world that um, my son is playing at Lollapalooza. And yeah, full circle. Uh, I text Chris Harrison last night and I'm like, oh, you will not believe what just happened. And that's what he said, full circle. It's funny that my son is playing on the same bill as Guns N' Roses and Billie Eilish and uh, Stevie Nicks. It's just crazy. So anyway, that's my news. And I, I just wanted to uh, just, uh, uh, oh, go ahead, Tim. Tim wants to share another leadership uh, tip from what I did this morning. Go ahead, Tim. So when you watch your mentor in action, it is so cool to, to do this, all right? Craig led by example doing something this morning. That auction that was going off, it started like the minimum bid was 1,000. Then like it was like 1,100, somebody good, 1,200. Craig kind of waited back. All right. Watch what everyone in the room was built was was bidding. And then he put a bid amount up that was like a jump to make everybody jump, but he knew he would win it. So sometimes like, you know, Eldana teaches your negotiating tip. He first of all, he kind of figured I'm sure he figured in his head what he was going to pay, but he watched what everyone else was bidding so that he knew how he can outbid them. They were going up $100 and I jumped at $300 yeah. and everyone, seriously, I said $1,500 and everyone turned around and yeah. I thought I'm getting a deal. <laughs> like yeah, That's a rock star tip. What he did, man, that's how you stand out as a rock star because yeah. he did. <laughs> yeah, no, it was, uh, it was just a, yeah, a, a lesson. There were so many things that um, um, I, I just like learned today. You know what it was also, I'm just uh, telling Glenn, yes. Yes, to Glenn, um, is like uh, the live event again, the energy in the room. It just gets you, do that one gets you excited again to like, like, because we haven't been in a room like that since for a year, over, you know, 15 months. And it was just a breath of fresh air, hopefully non COVID fresh air, but it was a breath of fresh air um, being in a room with a bunch of people. And, um, Thank you, Patricia. I know I am on freaking fire. I, I, I just, I can't believe my son is playing at Lollapalooza because I mean, that is the ultimate uh, festival in the world. I mean, it's crazy. And uh, so we're a fire from that. And then what happened this morning, I just feel I just, the best $750 really, because I feel it's a write-off. It is a write-off uh, that I ever spent for marketing. I just and I get to play with a uh, 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 at the LPGA tour. I get to play with the uh, professional golfers. Anyway, it's all very very great. That being said, more exciting than these two things is my very very special guest today. Been a friend of mine since 1926, I think it was. But we both look good for our age, I think. 
Um, but Glenn Morshauer, I, I, I put the bio out last night and it's not really even updated uh, his bio because he's done so many things since then. He's on a show called The Resident right now and really, really exciting. He's going to be on the last season of Ozark. He's, he's actually filming it like right now. So I'll let him tell you more about that. But uh, we're going to do like a, maybe a Q&A, whatever Glenn wants to do. He can start talking. We can take a couple of questions if you want. Uh, whatever you guys want to do uh, will be, Glenn is just totally open and that's who he is. You know, I keep in interrupting his meeting on Sunday nights with the Ken and Glenn show and we have so much fun. And uh, so he's, he's all over Clubhouse right now. He's all over uh, the Zoom stuff and StreamYard stuff. He's just out there and that's why he's as successful as he is. So without further ado, my dear, dear friend, let's hear it for Mr. Glenn Morshauer. Yay, 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 yay! <laughs> I think he's there somewhere. Hold on. Glenn, you might have to uh, unmute. No, yourself. I'm I'm here, brother. Oh, they, there they, you are. The family here needs to remember that you have to uh, unmute in order for me to hear applause. <laughs> otherwise, <laughs> otherwise, it's like a Charlie Chaplin movie. <laughs> yes. Unmute yourself. <laughs> Let's hear the applause. One, two, three. I don't need the applause. <laughs> I don't, I don't need. Hello, Gail. Hello, Wee! Gail. Nice Wee! to see you. Let's You're see. Great, Hello, brother. Donna. Look at all Merv, these people here. Merv, God. my brother. <laughs> nice to see some. Alan Skidmore's in the house. Mikey Wolf in the house. Mikey Wolf is in the house. Look hey, at them Glenn. all. Alan Skidmore's here? I, oh, TK, my gosh. Hey, what's up, baby? Hey. Uh, and I think I saw Alan Skidmore, you said? Yep. He's there somewhere. Where is Alan? Is Alan? He was incognito. Ah, now he's now he's got his camera on. Hey guys. Hey, okay, hey Glenn, cool. I'm gonna start off from last night's show. Congrats there, Grandpa. <laughs> oh, thank you. And since I don't have any actual grandchildren, my television grandchildren are even that much more important. To me. <laughs> yeah, that was a that was a cool episode. Good to see you. Yeah, thanks, man. Um, so you know, you mentioned shameless plug, Craig. Congrats on all of that, man. And way to go on your bid. Yeah, and being a part. Uh, how how wonderful that they get to be with you. Well, uh, I, you I like the way I turned that one yeah, around. Thank you. I, I did. I see what you did there, <laughs> and I appreciate that. But um, I'm just literally on fire, Glenn, because you know we haven't been live for so long, and there was an energy in that room today, and the speaker was really great, and I just was like. Oh, I feel like we're coming back, you know? And yeah, it's, well, I think we all feel that way. And I yeah. did not hear where you said the event was. So, Preston, uh, Preston which one, the golf tournament? Yeah, well, yeah, wherever the bidding was. Where did, where did that oh, happen? Oh, it was Success North Dallas in Plano at the Preston. Preston, well, Preston Wood. No, uh, that's Addison. Preston. Oh, hey, Tim. Good morning to you, brother. Hey, hey man. And Glenn, I can- Wait Glenn, a minute. I, I where's your you hair, there. dude? Where's your hair? I cut it off a year ago, dude. Well, I haven't seen you. I know. You know, a lot of us have had this this COVID thing hovering around, and we haven't really seen each other. So Crazy, the, right? the Tim I knew had much longer hair. You look good, man. Thank you, sir. I like it. You look very handsome. Yeah. Do you guys um, want to dating or something like that? So um, we'll we'll have our time. <laughs> but listen, I'm 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 very grateful. I'm just grateful. You know what? That's it. I'm just I'm grateful. I was in a clubhouse room this morning on gratitude. And what came up for me is I said, I'm so grateful that I really on every level live this understanding and that understanding being that I am not a human having and I am not a human doing. I truly am a human being and beingness is what I value most. I have zero interest in acquiring. Mm. Now just admit that to you. I, it's not, this life is not about what I can own. It isn't. And God bless you. If that's your gig, it ain't mine. And ownership starts getting very heavy after a while. The beautiful thing about beingness is it has zero weight. Mm. There's no weight to beingness. There's a lot of weight to having this, right? So, and then this is why storage units are very successful <laughs> because people have too much stuff. And yeah. so now they have to spend money to have somebody hold their stuff. Wow, yeah. George Carlin talked a lot about this years ago. It turns out Carlin was a brilliant philosopher in addition to being quite the comedian. Um, and Craigie, you know, I really would rather do something I don't think we've ever done, which is go straight 
to Q and A because uh -huh. I can offer thoughts that will show up in the A of the Q and A. I love it. You know, so, I, I just let me take like two minutes to give you guys a quick update. Uh, had I been on yesterday, I too would have given a shameless plug. And the plug I would have given would have been for our season finale, which was last night. You can still see it on Hulu, but the season four uh, finale of The Resident, which has been um, just an enormous blessing in my life and evidence that I don't have a ceiling. And I'm not being boastful when I say this, I'm being encouraging because the same is true for you to the extent that you embrace it. And that is this, what is your ceiling or do you have one? How high or low is your ceiling or do you have one with regard to the abundance quotient in your life? Do you have a ceiling? And what I would hope for is a profound absence of a ceiling, meaning that you will gratefully open your arms and receive the fullness of whatever is intended for your life. And that you can't imagine putting a stop. You can't imagine putting a stop on it. How much good can a person have? And I will tell you that the good that you receive, and this didn't come out of a book, this has simply been what has been whispered to me over the years. I value the whisper. I am a whisper implementer. So I not only hear the whispers, but I obey them. And it has led my life. At this point, I'm so deep in, it will never change for me. I will be an obedient whisper obeyer and follower for the duration. For however much longer I'm here in this world, I will continue to be led by the whisper. Voice of God for people who are believers. And yet what's interesting is whether you're a believer or not, that whisper is still very much alive and well in you. No matter what your philosophical outlook is, there still is that life guidance that exists in all of us. And its business is to know. That's where we, and that's why when people say, I knew it, and you go, really, did you? Where, where, where did you know that? And they say, well, you know, deep down. Mm. Right? So what if we just start our day from deep down? What if we skip all the human crap and just go straight to deep down? Since that seems to be where we know things and just reside in that place. Um, I had such a profound, lengthy history with intentionality, which is just being really clear, not only on what you want, which is sort of level one, but what it is you're ready for and what outcome are you ready to experience most? So the four levels of, of, of wanting, right? When you say, I want this. So it's, what do I want is level one. What do I want most is level two. What outcome do I want is level three. And what outcome do I want most? I will tell you that I don't even use the first three. Mm. I go straight to what outcome do I want most? And that outcome is not only for me, that outcome is much more than a myopic view of life, but it is an inclusive view. So what is the thing that I want? So what I want includes Craig, for example, having everything he has ever dreamed of that is in his best interest. And those things that are not in his best interest, I want him to not have those. That's part of the wanting. I want him to not get his way. In a clubhouse room this morning, someone talked about unanswered prayer, and then I spoke up. And my take, and I said, I'm not here to be confrontational, but I would like to offer that there is no such thing as unanswered prayer. It doesn't exist. All prayers are answered. They just might not be answered the way you were attached to them being answered. They're still being answered. And for the record, no is an answer. And I will tell you that when the heavens have bestowed very generously their nose upon me, the heavens knew what they were doing. Life knows when to give us the word no. Our job is to not only receive that, but be A-OK -okay with it unless we distrust life. My whole talk and my whole life has been devoted to an absolute trust of life as it is, not as I wish it were.
The truth is, I wish life were exactly as it is. One of the biggest problems, if not the biggest problems for human beings, is us being in this ongoing wrestling match with that which is. Please write that down, just like a, a resistance to that which is. So this is whatever this is, and then the struggle begins when we are in resistance to that which is. But when we roll with what is, then we are so much better off. We're so much healthier. We're so much more radiant. We are so much more available. We, Our receptors are at an all-time high where we are the recipients of infinite wisdom, divine intuition, and all of a sudden, the supernatural becomes the very natural. The supernatural becomes the very natural. And when we think, I can't believe it, no, actually, we can believe it, and it is that believingness that, that is the reason things are occurring. So I want to jump back real quickly to intentionality, and then I'll take some questions. This will be the shortest talk I've done, and then the rest will show up as we're discussing. Um, I'll give you some recent developments. So a year and a half ago, we, we do this uh, exercise in my workshop, and I still teach for 12 hours every Monday and every Tuesday, unless I'm actually filming, in which case the class runs without me. And yesterday morning, I started my day at 7 a.m. Uh, and headed off to set because I'm here in Atlanta. They shoot um, Ozark in the same city we shoot The Resident in here in Atlanta. So we wrapped The Resident a month ago. And then I came like 10 days later aboard Ozark. And I'm doing a three episode arc on what is my favorite show on television. Shh, don't tell anybody. My favorite show is not The Resident. <laughs> my, favorite, my favorite show is Ozark. So, um, you know, we do in our workshop an exercise called What You Claim on Your Pizza. And it's got some stank to it. It's got some hip to it. It's not, what would you like on your pizza? It's not that articulate. It's like, hey, what you claim for your pizza? What you claim for your pizza? I claim love on my pizza. I claim love on my pizza. I claim Denzel on my pizza. So I started claiming Denzel Washington on my pizza. And it was, hey, what you claim on your pizza? I claim Denzel on my pizza. And all the people around me are going, Denzel pizza, Denzel pizza, Denzel pizza, Denzel pizza. And they reinforce it. So that's, and, and Aldana's laughing because she's been in on many of these sessions with me. So whatever it is, whether you're claiming love, you're claiming health, you're claiming prosperity, you're claiming clarity, you're claiming gratitude, you're claiming abundance, but you're claiming it and you are not hoping, wishing, or wanting it into existence. You're claiming it. This is one of the reasons I do not encourage people to pursue their dreams. Do not pursue your dreams. Have your dreams. Leave the pursuit up for those who want to spend their life chasing. And then what happens is we acquire liver spots, wrinkles, and then we die. Right? While chasing. Because you kept telling anyone, man, I'm going to get out there and pursue my dreams. Well, you keep pursuing. I'm going to go ahead and just get over here in this line where we claim. And I'm not making fun of it. I'm saying that fundamentally it is that available to you unless you think it isn't. And Henry Ford said it best when he said, whether you think you can or think you can't, you're right. So what are you busy thinking? What are you busy thinking? Are you someone who believes dreams come true? Not only do they come true, they come true all the time, and they happen for people like me. That's your affirmation. Your affirmation is that dreams do come true. They come true all the time, and they come true for people like me. I'm being you, by the way, in case you hadn't figured that out. I'm not being me. I'm being you, where you are announcing that dreams come true for me. So there's a great, simple affirmation. Dreams come true for me. And here's what you don't modify it with in thought or in word. I hope. Because you've just shat upon your affirmation. Does everyone get that? That you're shatting upon your own? I'm, I'm being polite and saying shatting because somehow that sounds very polite, right? So you're shatting upon your own affirmation when you say dreams come true for me. I hope. No, dreams come true for me. That's where it stops. That's the affirmation in its entirety. And that it is, thank you, Janie, for that heart. I see that. Thank you. 
And, and I feel your support of that truth. And it is true, again, unless you think it isn't. And then it won't discount it being true. It'll just be true for everyone else and not you, because you'll be committed to wanting it to not be true, because unfortunately, you were the recipient of several societal downloads, which would have you believe that life needs to suck. Right? And we see evidence of that. We see lots of evidence of that where people have decided, for example, that relationships need to suck. And by the way, they need to fall apart. And then they act out the script as though it's a requirement that relationships need to fall apart. Craig and I have been together forever. He's my other wife. Alan Skidmore is my other wife. I have multiple other wives. Some of them are men. And you know, Alan's a good old boy from West Virginia, and I think I'm kind of a one-of-a-kind relationship with him because he's uh, he's just my brother. That's all there is to it. So I want to talk about all this stuff, but with regard to the Denzel, I put Denzel on my pizza for six weeks. So each week for six weeks, I said, I claim Denzel on my pizza, and everybody around me, about 25 people around in a circle went, Denzel pizza, Denzel pizza, Denzel pizza, Denzel pizza. So it's that reinforcement, right? Everybody rooting for everybody else. And it is in this bandwidth that we get rid of competition and we replace it with two other C words, cooperation and collaboration. Amen, brother. Thank you, Craigie. So I encourage you to get all that competitive crap. Just let it go. That's ego stuff. I got to compete. I got to beat. I got to be the best. No, you got to be the best version of yourself. You don't have to be better than other people. And when you're preoccupied with outdoing others, I want to tell you that itself is a roadblock. The idea that you need to beat people. Please get over that. One of the reasons I've done very well in show business is not one point in my life was I ever setting out to beat someone, including when I go into a net back, uh, network callback for a series regular role, what I know is they will never see this material done the way I'm going to do it by anyone. They'll see similar versions. They're not going to see mine. They'll see mine done by one person only, and that person is me. And I know that that's true for everybody. That's not uniquely true for me. But thank God I know it's true for me because that eliminates all thoughts of there being such a thing as competition. Someone say, well, it's a highly competitive business. Yes, if you wish to see it that way. And I don't. And not seeing it that way, by the way, has worked out extremely well. Mm -hmm. So why would I abandon a plan that works? And by the way, all the people I've shared this with over my life have said endlessly how much it changed their life for the better. And I've had zero emails, zero that said, you know, this whole idea of phasing competition out and replacing it with collaboration and cooperation, that just really sucks. And I really don't care for you mm. as a human being for having taught me that. I've never received such an email. So uh, what happened after that six weeks of putting Denzel on my pizza is I got a phone call that asked me if I wanted to play Denzel Washington's boss in a little film called The Little Things. Hello. Come on with it. Come on with it. <laughs> Come on with it. And then I went and, and did that. In January of this year, I called my agent and it said, you know, we're going to be done filming The Resident in, uh, in mid-April. And if we get picked up for a fifth season, we go back July the 6th. That's when we start filming. And then we'll premiere in October, probably. It might be September. Uh, I don't know the exact date of the fall schedule. But um, I'll have that little window of opportunity from mid-April to July 6th, about two and a half months to where I really, really would love to target Ozark. I'd love to target that show because it's their final season. And write this word down if you would, and I'm not saying this from pressure because the truth is I'm not invested in whether you write it down or not, but it will help you to write it down. And that word is belonging, belonging. And I would ask you the question today, where, where do you belong? Where do you belong? Where do you belong in life? Where do you belong in relationship? Where do you belong in prosperity? Where do you belong in that, that mindset of doing what you love for a living? Because my sense, and I told Harry this, that's my agent. I said, 
I belong on that show. Do you hear the vibrational difference between I belong on that show and I want to be on that show? Because I want to be on that show may not include belonging. Belonging. One of the reasons that I'm still married and will be until we croak. There's no maybe about that. We're in the till death do us part modality is because we belong here. I belong with Carolyn. In addition to wanting to be with her, we belong together. And thank God both parties feel that way. <laughs> like a sense of belonging. So I said, I, I, I feel like I, I belong on Ozark. And two months later, he called me and said, Bud, the people at Ozark want to talk to you about your sense of belonging. <laughs> It was great. And, uh, and they, they want to have a Zoom meeting with you. So we did. And they brought me in to play the head of the FBI in this beautiful final season turn. Um, and they also invited me to be on the most important episode there is, which is the finale of the entire season. Wow. So I'm, doing, I'm doing the earlier episodes now, but then I will come back in September to film the very final show of the entire series, not just season four, but the whole thing. So again, how good can it get? You tell me. No ceiling. Because nope. if you don't have a ceiling, then you're going to experience a lot of goodness in your life. And you're going to experience a lot of it by noticing that it's already there and get out of this trap of, of sitting, waiting for life to start getting good. Start counting your blessings like right now. Start counting them right now because you will be able to fill a notebook of the list of things that are wonderful about your life just as they are, mm -hmm. just as they are. And that will take you out of that human trap of wishing they were different, wishing they were different. Where do you think depression comes from? Wishing things were different than they are. Mm. Right. So now you're bumming about it instead of just looking around and going, oh, my God, I had thirty three thousand five hundred and sixty heartbeats while I slept that went unsupervised. Thirty three five sixty. That's the actual math in an eight hour based on seventy two beats per minute. Thirty three thousand five hundred and sixty heartbeats. And I wasn't responsible for any of them. I was busy napping. I was catching up on rest. Right. So I'm grateful for that. Uh, I'm grateful that we've been covid free. In my family, I'm grateful that Zoom exists because that allowed us to do things like this throughout this time of isolation. My workshop continues, and the list goes on and on. I'm grateful for this hotel room. Let me tell you what I'm not grateful for. No, I'm going to word it differently. I am grateful. You see this behind me? I'm actually grateful that I don't own that piece of art. <laughs> I'm going to just express my gratitude. I think it's one of the ugliest pieces of art I've ever seen. And I'm glad that it sits here at the Ritz Carlton without my support. <laughs> right. I get to look at it daily. And every day I have the same thought. If I am so glad you do not hang in my home. <laughs> so there's an example of humorous gratitude, right? It's like the, the guy who looks up into the sky and is just contemplating things. And someone walks up and goes, what, what's going on? You look like you're thinking and you go, I was, and they say, what about, and you say, I was just thinking about how wonderful it would be if you weren't here. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Hey, let's do Q&A, Craigie. Okay. Hey, I love uh, you all. I love you all. I hope you're busy loving yourselves. I, I am. Really do. And Chris Kobe said, I woke up this morning. I am grateful. There you go. That says it right there. I just woke up. Uh, all right. So we have uh, some comments on here, but, uh, you know, about Ozark. Congratulations. Uh, all these great comments, but if oh, anyone oh, oh, wait, 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 time out one sec. I got to tell you about a Bateman moment. I got to tell you about a Jason yeah. Bateman moment. So Jason comes up to me we, we had already started our first day two weeks ago with really nice chatter about the show and his position as executive producer. And he directs a lot of the episodes, by the way, these two episodes are being directed by Robin Wright. Many of you know her oh. as Robin Wright Penn, yeah. used to be married to Sean Penn. So Robin is directing these. Wow. And, and he comes up to me and he goes, don't you look dapper? And I said, yeah. And he goes, look at your lapel pen. And I said, yep. They almost put it on the wrong side. They were trying to put it on the right. And he goes, 
there's a side? And I said, yes, there is. And I said, do you know why they put it on the left? And he goes, no. I said, because it's closest to your heart. And he goes, oh, that's beautiful. And I said, I also played the head of the Secret Service on 24 for seven years. Let me ask you this. Do you know why the Secret Service wear dark glasses? He said, no. I said, it's to keep the sun out of their eyes. <laughs> he, about, he about choked. He uh, felt so stupid. <laughs> come on, we're waiting for this big uh, reason. Exactly. Why. He thought there was going to be some right. sort of procedural answer. It's like, That's no, right. it's to keep the sun out of their eyes. <laughs> Brilliant. All right, let's you take questions. Brilliant, you Secret Service. All right, Delilah Andre has her hand up first. If you have a question, just raise your hand. You know, you can do it in the um, in the chat area. Delilah, you are on with Mr. Glenn Warshaw. Delilah is an actress, just did her uh, short film but I'll ask, uh, let her ask. Oh, hi, Delilah. Hi, Glenn. It's so nice seeing you. I saw you once at a live rock star a long time ago. Yeah. And I'm so happy to see you here again. Wow, you're just so incredibly inspiring. You know, um, I was in a situation where there was something I didn't want on my pizza. <laughs> yeah, hey, that's, <laughs> part, that's it. part of it. <laughs> exactly. And um, I... Uh, I, I guess about two years ago, the last agent I had um, before I started making movies myself, um, you know, I had, I ended up turning down a very lucrative role in a prominent TV series. And I was not in a position to be turning down roles, but it just felt so degrading to women. And it just felt really awful. Like if I were- Well, to wait a minute, this, time out, time out. Maybe you were in a position. Yeah. To turn yeah. down roles, which is exactly why you turned it down. You know, I think you're right because there was something inside of me that said, if you say no to this, that means you really do believe in yourself. And yes, ma'am. Yeah. And I really killed it at the audition and, and I, I booked a different role, but they changed the role on me. So the specific role that I had actually gone, you know, out for, I was really excited. I coached my, my acting coach that morning. Everything was great, you know. Uh, I had callbacks, everything, but then they changed the role on me last minute and it just was really crazy. I won't go into the details of what the role was, but it was like, you know, anyway, so I remember thinking that, and then for two years, I mean, uh, my agent didn't send me out, nothing happened. And I just started writing and decided to create my own roles because I wanted to create the types of work that I personally resonated with and wanted to put out there. And um, I ended up doing my film, um, White Dove. Uh, it's called White Dove, The Origin. It's a short film. It's in the film festival circuit and it's already won six awards and hasn't premiered yet because of COVID, but we'll, we'll be premiering it probably when things open back up. Did you shoot it pre-COVID uh, or during COVID? Let's put it this way. I, we barely shot it pre-COVID. I mean, it was okay. pre-COVID, but we just finished like the last pickup shots literally before everything shut down and I did, went into post during COVID. So I was very blessed and fortunate. This, I felt honestly, I felt like God was leading me to do this project awesome. along the entire way and everything was coming together. Every time there was some kind of obstacle, it was suddenly lifted. It was just incredible. And same with now, like the film is, is getting a lot more traction than I had ever anticipated. And, um, and I, I, my question for you is this, um, and I know I have to get over this, but I really need to um, feel excited about getting a new agent again. And I, I just had such a bad experience with the last one that I just, I've been so avoiding it. And I've even had people giving me referrals and I've been not following through. I don't know if it's maybe I should wait until I do the film festival circuit and then maybe they will find me or if it's better to start pursuing some of these referrals. Um, I'm just in a, in a funny situation that way. I wanna make sure that it's not just fear holding me back, but also um, that there's a good reason for it. Well, what does your gut tell you? It's interesting. I think my mind was saying you should follow up with these people. Well, get rid of the should. Yeah. The, the, that should's not gonna be helpful. But what does your gut tell you? Or have you talked to it? You know, I did get a little message that came through yesterday that um, that I was going to be meeting people through the film festivals. Um, and the agents would be coming to me because my as my film is getting more buzz, 
that that would happen. I think maybe a combination of the two might be good. I think there's just one agency that I feel I need to, to actually follow up with. Uh, but other than that, I, I feel like maybe I should hold off and just have the right agency come to me. That's sort of what I'm feeling. Yeah, there, there are some things that are lingering in your speech that you picked up along the way. And it's not your fault. It's just something that's occurred. But, and, and, but I'm, tr I'm trained to spot these things because I'm a teacher and I've been a teacher for 36 years. So your words, not mine, you said, and then they went and changed the role on me. And I'm here to tell you that that's not true. They changed the role. They didn't change the role on you. They changed the role. Yeah. It wasn't on you. It wasn't to you. They changed the role. You're adding, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> you're adding the more. Yeah. You're adding that victimized interpretation uh -huh. that they did it to you. And on me and to me are destroyers. And they get said a lot in this world. The on me's, the to me's, and the made me's. We are always at choice. They did what they did. You did what you did. Yeah, End so of story. Good. I had a, a woman I was counseling in, a, in another session on Zoom recently. And um, I want to I be exact in what I say. But she had mentioned that, oh, that the job just wasn't hers to get. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. A standard phrase you'll hear. And I said, then why did you go? She went, what? Well, I wanted the job. I said, well, if it wasn't yours to get, why did you go? And she really had to ponder that. I said, you know, that fate had not been predetermined and she was reading into, and then she brought God into it. And I'm a person of faith. I cannot tell you how many, certainly hundreds, and that way it won't be an exaggeration, certainly hundreds of actors, if not thousands, leave Los Angeles every year blaming their lack of success hmm. on God's plan. Wow. So for example, they will say, yeah, well, God just, you know, God just didn't want me to be an actor. No, let me, let me state that differently. You laid around on your ass on a couch for two years, eating ding dongs, and you never enrolled in a workshop. So now you've interpreted that as God's message that he didn't want you to be an actor. Really? Because I'm here to tell you, God doesn't care about you being an actor. The only thing that is ever a concern of the cosmos is the content and execution of what is in your heart. You can be a plumber, you can be an actor, you can be a politician, it doesn't matter. But the idea that God just didn't want me to be, a, now what it is, is it's an excuse to fail. And it is also blaming God for it, or not blaming, but hanging our hat on God. So now it somehow becomes a divine calling that we failed. Right? And it gets done all the time. So let's get rid of the two me's, let's get rid of the made me's. Just get rid of them. And if that hurts to hear, and I don't mean for you, Delilah, I mean anybody, well, some things hurt when we learn them, and especially when we consider how long we have carried around that pattern of victimized speech. But yeah. the beautiful thing is we can heal it, like right now, by just ending speaking that way. So what I said to this woman, because she was really heartbroken over this job that hadn't developed, and it had crippled her self-esteem. And she was reading all of this peripheral crap into the fact that she didn't book the job. But it was part of God's plan and all of this. And here's what I said to her. I said, can I sum this up a little differently than, than you are summing it up? And she said, sure. I said, you, you didn't get the job. That, that's the whole long-winded <laughs> story. <laughs> that, that's the whole long-winded story. You didn't get the job. Yeah. And the idea that you've decided it just wasn't my day. I'm sorry. I have a cough. Bullshit. Bullshit. <laughs> okay. Oh it God. just wasn't your day. You know, and, and now there's another one blaming the day, blaming the day. 
holding God responsible or blaming the day, you know? I just realized it's, it was God's plan for me because God wanted me to make this movie that I did. And I was in a place where financially I was almost homeless. Um, my home was in foreclosure and I um, fortunately, thank God I saved it, but I needed that money really bad. But I said no, because I really believed that I could do this, but it could be, I wanted to, to do roles that, that really resonated, that I just knew would put out a good message in the world. And it actually, because that happened, it was the last thing that I needed to drive me to start creating my own content because mm. I'd always wanted to be a writer and right. a director. Yeah. So do you talk out loud to your gut? Um, not usually. <laughs> okay. So just know that that's available to you. Yeah. An out loud dialogue with your gut. I like that. And, and knowing in advance of its infinite wisdom. So for example, one of the reasons I don't pray for strength is because that is an insult to the creator that already gave me strength. Mm. Yeah. I don't ask for things I already have. And I was given strength at birth. And I've had it my whole life. So while others are saying, gimme, 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 I'm saying, thank you. Yeah. That's the difference in my prayer life. Yeah. And I'm not flaunting that. I'm saying that thank you is a fantastic prayer. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you is a fantastic prayer. So while someone else is saying, Lord, give me the strength. Do you know that even in the serenity prayer, and I'm getting ready to rock some people's worlds with this, but after all, Craig's program is called rock your life. Yeah, so fasten, fasten your seatbelt kids. Cause I'm going to say the most daring thing you've ever heard. So I've been to many, many, many 12 step meetings. I'm an unusual attendee in that I'm not an alcoholic, but my brother was, and it killed him. So I haven't spoken with a lot of you since, but my brother's 40 plus year struggle with alcoholism ended in his death two years ago. He died at 22,659 days of age, 22,659. And 12 days ago, I was 22,659 days old. Mm. And I devoted that entire day to my brother because I had reached the threshold where his life ended. So on that day, I had something occur that did not occur for my brother, which is that I was given the gift of waking up. So I'm on bonus time. I only had one full blood sibling and he has exited the physical realm, but he lasted 22,659 days. He would not go to a 12 step meeting. He was unwilling. So I attended for him mm. as a non-alcoholic so that I could, because he trusted me. I was one of the few people he trusted in this world. So I attended the meetings in order to gain an understanding I didn't have since I'm not an alcoholic. I wanted to be around alcoholics to learn about their their way of being and their, their backstories. And I wanted to see the universality to it and the commonality. And, and I wanted to hear their pain and I wanted to see, I wanted to see the predictable aspects of it so that I could be of help to him since you trust me, but you don't trust a bunch of strangers and you don't trust the program. Mm. And in that I learned a lot. And one of the things that is always said, is God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Many of you, some of you I saw reciting it with me. Mm -hmm. Now, in my view, and I'm not being a megalomaniac, I'm being a noticer and nothing more. Patricia knows that about me, Patricia, who's here today. I am a noticer. And one of the things noticers do is they notice things. And here is one of the profound noticings that I have made, yes, even in our serenity prayer. What it says is one more time, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Listen to this ever so slight rewrite. God granted me. 
that's the rewrite. Mm. Not God grant me because that presupposes that he didn't. Yeah. There is no God grant me. And the he or she is irrelevant. Please know that I, I, I believe in a genderless God. So if I use the term he, that's out of my upbringing. But my point is, even the people that created the serenity prayer didn't stop to think that they are asking for something that's already occurred. And that's why they feel weak. Mm. The reason they feel weak is they live from that presupposition of not having. So therefore, I'm going to say, grant me that. I don't need to say, grant me the serenity. What I need to say is, thank you for serenity. Mm. God granted me the serenity. So listen to how that sounds. God granted me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. God granted me the courage to change the things I can. And God granted me the wisdom to know the difference. All of those things are already true. And now I can stand in that truth instead of standing in hoping, wishing, wanting, and weakness. Mm. And our life, our lives as human beings depend on us constantly being noticers of a better way. Mm. Right? So once upon a time, people were probably changing tires with pliers. And then someone went, you know, we don't have to get bloody knuckles. And then someone invented the lug wrench and then someone invented the jack, right? So if you're broken down on the side of the highway and, and someone pulls up with a jack and you don't have one, it would be really weird to resist that because they have a tool that will get your car up in the air and then you don't have to have bloody knuckles because they also have a lug wrench. And maybe if you're really lucky, somebody has an electronic air wrench and they come up and go, burr, 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 and they got four bolts gone. <laughs> Your lug nuts are changed instantly. So there are mindsets that are the equivalent of having a lug, like an air wrench. If you have the right mindset, you move through life going, burr, 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 and someone else is sitting there with bloody knuckles. Mm. It's a great metaphor. It's great. So does that help you at all, Delilah? Yes, it really does. Thank you. I really appreciate that. You Are you based in LA? Yes, I am. Good for you. Yeah. And Good I'm very interested in checking out your classes as well. Yeah, please. Please. Craig will tell you how to reach me. I will. I'll let me, uh, let me, let me talk to Lori. What's up, Lori? Yeah, Lori, my high school sweetheart. <laughs> uh, unmute yourself, Lori. Hit the space bar. And Delilah, thank you, honey, for being open to that. Yes, thank you so much. It really helped uh, change my perspective. Good, good, good. Here All right, Lori's on. Hello. Can you hear me? Uh, yep. Okay. Uh, amazing, Glenn, as always. Um, so I'm in a kind of a strange position where I believe my, you know, I'm a quote person. My favorite quote I told you once you liked it was, have a nice day unless you've made other plans unless you've made other plans that's like my favorite yes um i'm also serenity is not freedom from the storm but peace amid the storm um and i feel like i appreciate things i'm a cancer survivor i had a very super aggressive cancer if if one thing went wrong i wouldn't be here but it didn't and i'm cancer free eight years i feel like i appreciate that though this has been a really bad year i'm a photographer professional photographer. So I was completely shut down through COVID. Um, I saw everybody saying, you know, redirect and re, you know, you got to reinvent, you got to do something and just nothing. Like I just couldn't make it work. And it's been a little bit of a rough time trying to get back to where I was. I mean, it's happening now a little bit, but I, I feel like I must be blocking it somehow. Um, and I don't, I can't uncover, like, I feel like I believe, and I, I'm trying to, I'm so conscious of how I'm saying things. And believe me, so I am I, because I'm like, taking notes. <laughs> I love I you. Feel like I feel like I believe notes. everything, but I feel like I must not because, you know, I'm, I don't know. So I'm sort of at a weird place because, you know, I'm, I know I'm doing something 
or I'm not doing something that I should be doing. And I just can't figure it out to, to change my trajectory of this COVID yeah. path. So there are four things you can get rid of right off the bat. I don't, I can't, bad year, and should. Okay. And I, I love don't shit on yourself. <laughs> right. So, I mean, there are four of them. Right I'm shitting on myself. Right. Don't. You, in, your, in your share, you said, I don't. You also said, I can't. You said it was a bad year, which there is no such thing. The year itself is not intrinsically flawed. Because the same year that you've labeled bad, somebody else was winning the lottery. Somebody else was having somebody ask them to marry them. Mm. Somebody else was losing their virginity and damn happy about it. <laughs> right? So my point is the year arrives neutral and we're the ones that put the label on it. So it may, you may have found that your experience of it was challenging, but the year itself must not be labeled bad because the moment we label the year bad, it's game over. Cause now we've given our power to the year. The year is now running our lives. We're not. Does, I mean, does that make sense for everybody? You've decided the year it's a terrible year. Well then, hang it up and go to sleep for the year is what I would say. <laughs> and I'm not saying that to be lighthearted. I'm saying oh, okay. we got to really be careful not to label the year bad because the minute we do, we've shut all other streams down. And, and it is going to be an uphill battle from that point forward based on the pre-decision to label it a bad year. So what if you just hold a new opinion about it, that the year is what I decided is. And I believe stuff like that. Like one of my favorite things when times get rough is to say it's an AFCO, which is another fucking growth opportunity. Because I believe when things are challenging, it's, it is an opportunity to grow. I struggle to see where I grew through COVID having no ability to do, well, I, I actually did do photography. I, the, I did a, the front porch project, which was going across the whole, nation where I went to families' homes and photographed them from a distance. And since most families were home, it was, but it wasn't enough to not make my bills, you know, paying, you know, paying all my bills was still a challenge. It wasn't I, enough I mean, I, I like what I used the, to be doing. I understand all those things. One of the other things you added earlier that I left out is when you said you couldn't. You said, but I, but I just couldn't. And it's like, as again, as though something were keeping that from happening, which is also not true. So when we change, listen, everyone very carefully to this language, because it's, we got to put up, we got to put on our big boy girls and in, in our big boy panties here and big girl panties is I couldn't when we're ready to, when we're ready to really experience strength, I couldn't becomes I didn't. And that's ownership. But when we say we couldn't, it sounds as though there were forces present that disallowed that. And instead, it's simply that I didn't. I didn't. And then we, we're, we're in position to write a better script for ourselves. That's all. I mean, COVID, one of, the, one of the primary things COVID did is it gave us all a chance to stop and look and go, resourcefulness, you're up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know of anyone that didn't run into that. Hello, resourcefulness. Now, I guess if I didn't understand the word until now, I guess I'm getting ready to understand what resourcefulness means. And think of what you did, Glenn. You, you had live acting classes. In three states. In three states. And you had to adjust and and now you even said the other day like i don't know if i'll go back to live no i didn't say i don't know if i said i won't i won't yeah no i'm done yeah i'm done with physical buildings yeah. because my resourcefulness showed me that though it wasn't what i originally wanted because i love flesh and blood human beings so look what have here's an example Lori. so i used to fly dallas i would start my week in dallas i would teach monday tuesday take the day off wednesday be at home with Carolyn Thursday morning, I got on a plane and flew to LA. We have a home in LA. So I'm in LA, teach Thursday night, Friday night, get on a plane Saturday morning out of Burbank airport, 
fly to Salt Lake City, teach there Saturday night, fly back to Dallas Sunday, rinse and repeat every week and loved it. And then the resident came. And when the resident came four years ago, I shut down Salt Lake City. I outsourced my LA school and then kept the Dallas school for my only physical one that I attended regularly because I commute back and forth between Atlanta and Dallas. And then COVID hit and said, so now your LA school is going to be closed and your Dallas school is going to be closed. So do I move in salt? Do I move into a sulking modality? Or do I say, this being closed is unacceptable to me because I'm unwilling to lose this group. I believe in it with every fiber of my being. Therefore, resourcefulness. Hello, what do we do? Enter a man named Ken Walls, right? Because there was a commitment that was non-negotiable. Non-negotiable. I'm having this. And that's that, that's that decision of we're doing this. And I'm sure that that was present in dealing with uh, cancer for you. Did you call upon your highest available good during that time? Lori, I'm asking you. Yeah. Um, I mean, it happened so quickly. It was a very strange situation. But afterward, yeah, I mean, every... Every time I had to enter the cancer center for tests that, you know, whether it came back or not came back, damn right. <laughs> damn right. So it became, let's do this thing. Right. Let's do this thing. And let's do it from the highest place available. Best case scenario, we've been given a situation and I'm committed to bringing my best to it because that gives me my best shot. And that's all we have in life. We don't have guarantees. What we have is our best shot. And we have our best shot when we bring our best game. Right? And that's always going to be enough. I mean, what else can we do other than bring our finest game? So when people say, for example, here's one of the biggest lies. I've got new ones, Craig. I'm not going to get into them, but I will, I will just say one today. One of the biggest lies that uh, is floating out there is when people say, well, I did the best. You, I, I did the best I could. Mm. I got to tell you that 90% of the time, that's bullshit. Mm -hmm. about 10%, it really is the truth. So if an actor says, you know, I did the best I could with the scene, I go, really? So let me, let me, let me reset the situation. So if one week ago, I had told you that Steven Spielberg would be joining us this week, because I know Steven, I've done six movies with Steven. If Steven were to have been sitting in our class, do you think you might've spent more time with your script? <laughs> you think you might've studied a little harder? You think you would have been fully memorized and ready? Yes. Well, then you didn't do your best. Mm. So a more honest statement, when people tell you, or if you're playing that bullshit game of telling everybody, I did the best I could stop right there and ask yourself, is that bullshit? Is what I just said, a big steaming pile of bullshit? Cause did I really, is there anything I could have done differently or better? And if at that point you come up with no, then you have a right to say it. But if you're saying it because it's just what we wacky humans say, that's not cool. And people do it all the time. Mm -hmm. So under a different set of circumstances, had it been differently incentivized, see, Lori, you were incentivized by cancer. Cancer came in and incentivized your life. I mean, and is I that mean, a true statement? It is true. Absolutely. So when, and, and when we are living in choice, then we can declare what we are incentivized by. Mm. We get to declare that. In acting, we have a term for it. It's called stakes. And as a coach, four times a week, I will tell actors, we got to jack up the stakes because I don't care right now when I watch this scene. I don't care. And I, you need me to care. Mm -hmm. So we're not invested enough. And the only way you're going to be invested and you're going to get me to be invested is if you raise the stakes. So what happens if, anyway, it, it's all the same. It's all the same stuff, but it's, you know, this can, this can be beautiful moving forward.
Mm -hmm. and the year does not need to be labeled bad. It can have been a rough stretch of time, but it had nothing to do with the year. It had everything to do with how I showed up during the year. Mm -hmm. And when life gives us, I mean, we all know the lemons lemonade quote. I don't need to, to go through that one, but there's a lot of brilliance to that. And so I think the thing that that we all could stand to grow at is the art of healthy processing. Please write that down, the art of healthy processing. So am I processing this moment from the highest available place? And a great way to get clear on that is this simple question, and I didn't make it up. The question is, what would love do? What would love do? And there are different iterations of that. So for example, what would prosperity do in this moment? Well, prosperity would pick up the check from my buddy, Craig. Why? Because I can and I want to. That's what prosperity would do. What would kindness do? What would ego do? And then don't do that. <laughs> right? So one of the things ego would do in a given situation is ego would need to be right and would want to fight. And it would want to do this. And we run into this in, in relationships. But what would love do? We just get back to what would love do and then do that. And it might not always be the easiest thing because it might have to admit that maybe we've been a bit dickish. <laughs> right? And then we realize I'm not doing that because if I'm doing that, I'm not being loving. And that's not who I'm committed to being. Anyway, I hope that helps, Lori. Completely. Yes, very much so. Good. Big All right, Eldana. Eldana. I'll try to I'll try to tighten up my uh, answers okay. a little bit, but I'm in the spirit of thoroughness. It's just kind of who I am. Yeah, Donna's great. We love it. Eldana, go ahead. Hi, Glenn. Hi, sweet. Uh, I I do have a question, but I want to share a quick whisper story because you know I'm I a love it. follower. Are you in the states right now? I am. I'm heading to Kenya the 28th. Oh my goodness. Finally, I'm so. I great. just love that you you treat Kenya from Los Angeles like Dallas and Fort Worth. It's like, no, I'll be in Kenya next week. Right? Yeah, I'm just. It's gone. beautiful. <laughs> I have my little thing, and and I keep my. I have a way to keep myself fresh, so when I'm there and I hit the ground, we're going. So it's that's great. great. That's great. But the the whisper, well, the whisper is what got me to Kenya, and the whisper back in October was like pushing me like a bulldozer. So the whisper with me is kind of like you have to do this. You have to do the Go, go, go. And the, the, the whisper pushed me to get a job. And I thought, I don't want to get a job. That's what I was thinking. I don't want to get a job. Whisper, you have to get a job. I said, okay, I'm going to get a job because my speaking's drying up. I don't understand. It was October, 2019. And I'm like, okay, whisper, I trust you. And I said, I'd I don't belong in El Segundo because my background's defense contracting and there's, I don't belong in El Segundo. That's too far. I won't have the energy to work my business. I don't belong in Camp Pendleton. That's too far. The, all those thoughts. I, the about, best outcome that I want is a job 30 minutes or less from my house. And I went to a veteran's place that helps vets. Oh, you're too old. You're going to have a tough time. I said, okay, I'm leaving. You're not the one to help me. I looked through LinkedIn, applied for a job in uh, Anaheim at a company called L3 Harris, and they called me immediately, and I was hired immediately. And then COVID hit. Had I not taken that job, my speaking obviously dried up. I've done some online speaking. Had I not listened to the whisper and taken that job, I would my ladies wouldn't have made it. I wouldn't have been able to sustain the business to keep them going. And another thing I decided was I was going to raise at least a thousand dollars a month to feed them, and it just came every single month. So sometimes I don't listen to the whisper. Most of the time I do. But one thing I think you might have answered my question because when you talked about what would kindness do, what would prosperity do with the what would love do. With the, the, with the, I'm running ads and I'm starting to get more out there. And there are just people who are nasty and the, cause I'm white helping a black community. I get called racist. I get called a white savior and all this stuff. And I, I think you just answered that by, I, and I feel bad for them. I don't respond. I usually delete the comments 
but I get so many of them. I'm just wondering how to handle that. But I think these questions in my mind is probably a good way to do that. Right. So the thing is in consciousness, you're moving faster. And when we move faster, we are met with greater resistance, Mm. right? So think about an airplane. It doesn't feel resistant wind so much at 10 miles per hour, but as it gains speed on the runway, all of a sudden it gets so much resistance that it actually lifts up, which is beautiful, right? So aerodynamically, when we design ourselves in a way that is spiritually so, that we, we don't complain about adversarial winds anymore, but instead we choose to soar. And I refer to this as kite consciousness, right? Just become a, a kite. So while other people are bitching about the adversarial winds, we go into the mindset of a kite and we flourish. Mm. So it's all, it all, again, it goes back to our opinion. I couldn't help but notice that you use the word belonging again. I, I said a bit earlier that it all comes down to a sense of belonging and and it's where we belong and also where we don't belong. And, and we know this. And I only have, first of all, you don't, you don't need anything. You're so clear on all of this. It's, it's, you know, you're, you're wide awake in your life and it's gorgeous. Um, but it was on something um, about, belong- oh, I know this. As I was listening to you, I had this thought because you were referring to the whisper. And here's one of the great truths about the whisper. The whisper knows the weather long before meteorologists do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's the truth. The whisper knows the oh, weather. That's great. And what that means is the whispers can advise you about what's coming. And that's why you were moved to go get that job. Right? But but we don't we don't we're not made privy to any of this until we become conscious and we practice the art of trusting. So if we trust when we pray, when we meditate, when we get still and quiet, then if we don't trust that, then we are, we are not the beneficiaries of all the help that is available. I don't know, but I would think, and I'm going to ask the group in general, and it sounds like a question where the answer is a word from the sixties. And that word was duh. Right. So it seems like duh is the answer, but are you someone who would want all of the help that's available to you? Duh. 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 (laughs) I would. So if, if it could be verified for you, I'm asking the room this right now, if it could be verified for you and it can be, by the way, that every one of you has extrasensory perception. Every one of you do. Every one of you have sensory perception and many of you, it's well beyond what you've agreed to. So you just simply haven't said yes to it, but it's there. And you can get still and let it advise you, let it guide you, let it warn you of weather systems that are coming your way. But if we don't, if we don't listen to those things, then we sit around until circumstances destroy our home. And I'm talking about this home, right? The home of our heart, not a physical structure called a house or a home, but our well-being. When the writing was on the wall, if we had been whispering or listening rather to our whispers, and then we, we do whatever it is we do when we're under the influence of the whisper, and you did. You were also under the, whisper, the whisper's influence to even get this relationship going with Africa. And you did it. And now you go there like it's next door. <laughs> and, and I teach and, them the pizza game using Udon. I know you do. And, and I love it every time I see your videos of it. Right. We'll so, be doing that again. <laughs> let's jump over to Gail. I love you, Eldana. Thank you. Gail Barbie, you are up, girlfriend. Ooh, unmute. Yeah. Hey, Glenn. It's Hi, so sweetie. great to see you. Nice You're, to see you. It's You are such an inspiration to me and... Uh, you had mentioned something when you were talking a bit ago and I've heard you say this several times I didn't have my hand raised and I said I tell him Gail just tell him (laughs) you know it wasn't a whisper it was a shout tell him him. 
<laughs> and um, is that all? You, and, and, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, um, something that I've heard you say several times is, you know, quit hoping and wishing and wanting. Yeah. I've been saying that for years. And, um, every time you say that it just, it hits me in the gut and it just, it hurts because hope is such a huge word to me. And I'm like, without hope, um, I don't know where I would be. And, um, I question why. Why do you use that word in particular? The wishing and wanting, I understand, but the hoping has been a huge well, word let, for me, faith-wise. Let, let me then back up and be more clear. Mm -hmm. It's it's not that it's not that there's no hoping. Mm -hmm. It's that hoping in and of itself is not an action word. Right. Well, I'm hoping it'll go well. Okay. Well, it sounds like you're, I don't mean you, Gail, but most right. of the time people say, oh, you know, you go, Hey, have a killer meeting on Monday. And you go, yeah, I hope it goes well. <laughs> so when you're saying, I hope it goes well, it means you're reserving space for doubt. Mm. Right. That's all. Right. And the point is there's more to be doing than hoping. So let, let's look at it from a construction place. If, um, if you're a, let's say you're, you're a very wealthy business owner and you stand on a piece of property that's vacant and it, a lot of space and you go, boy, I sure hope there'll be a high rise here someday. Okay. That's a nice start. Now what? Right. That's my relationship with hope. Right. It's a nice start. Now what? Because standing and hoping there'll be one there is not going to make it so. Mm -hmm. That's my pitch with regard to hope. It's a great beginning. And it's even an important beginning. But there's a follow-up game mm -hmm. to hope. And it really is the two words, now what? I've done my hoping. I hope there'll be a building there. Well, then put one there. <laughs> right do something about it. Then you quench the thirst of hoping. And you also end all hoping because now it is there just mm -hmm. like you hoped. But if you hope and walk away, that building's not going to show up or it'll be someone else's building and someone else's design. Right. So, so, do we want something to have our unique fingerprint on it? And if we do, then you're the gal to do it. That's a really key thing is when you've got something you hope for, there's a reason that hoping is going on and it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's life beckoning us to be the one to do something about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You hope that so then make it so. Right do what it takes. But I, I don't intend to badmouth hoping. I think the problem is that people stop at hoping. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, hoping can be used as a block. And I see it happen constantly. When I ask an actor and regarding an audition, they go, I hope it goes well. Why are you hoping it goes well? Make it go well. Right. You are that powerful. You are that powerful. And if you really reside in the lane of consciousness that sees it being so, I'll promise you, when I had that meeting with those people in Ozark, I didn't have one ounce of hoping they would hire me. Not one ounce. I went in that room to tell the truth of the character. I didn't even go in there to make them hire me. I went in there to tell them the character's truth and I released it and I let it go. And Carolyn said, she goes, how'd it go? I said, perfectly. She said, good. And I said, I'm already celebrating. This, this was right after the Zoom call because they don't hire you in the meeting. Right. So I said, it went perfectly. And she said, fantastic. You think they'll call? I said, I have no idea. Hmm. I'm already celebrating. Why? Because I did what I went in there to do. So for me, it went perfectly and I'm not waiting to assess it that way based on what they do. So then they call me and I now decide it was perfect. And if they don't, I decide that not only was it not perfect, but 
apparently I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and now I feel wounded. Right. Because it didn't go my way. Well, maybe it did go my way. Maybe Steven Spielberg has four months he wants me to do with him on a movie in Australia, and there's a reason it didn't happen. There you go. There's the mindset that I have now, too. I, I've Right. So why are we so friggin' attached to life going our way? What if we submit to, how about, how about I let life do what it knows how to do? Mm. I mean, can you talk about something that will balance your, bro- your blood pressure like that? Is just just really reside in that that certainty that life knows exactly what it's doing, and then you go, oh, that is that is a real relief. It's like everything happens for a reason. Yeah, so I'm not anti hope. I knew I'm that. Just, I'm just anti stopping at hope. Right. I I want more than hope. I want action. Mm-hmm. right can you imagine a running back being given the football and all the way down the field going <laughs> i hope nobody hits me <laughs> i have a better thought why don't you outrun them <laughs> keep them from hitting you instead of doing a lot of hoping you must be talking about the kansas city chiefs oh you are so <laughs> insufferably happy right now <laughs> i am <laughs> Go Cowboys. Uh, I that's like funny. Cowboys. Glenn, Glenn and I are going to go to some games this year. We are going to go as, as soon as the COVID situation relaxes, Brad will have us in the booth. I love it. Gail, I hope that helps, honey. It did. Thank you and, so and much. Mainly to clear up the, the idea of being anti-hope because I don't, I never want to be anti-hope because frankly, hope often is, is the starting and last thread. Mm. Cause I know this much. If you take somebody's hope away, it's right. game over. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah. it, Hope is a necessity, mm-hmm. but it is not a final resting place. Right. Does that land? Absolutely. Okay, good. Thank then you. We're on, then we're on the same page. Yeah. Thank uh, you. What about Art? Art. Hi, Glenn. Hey, buddy. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Glenn. You're an amazing person. Uh, there's something really special about you as a human being. And thanks to Craig, I know why. When I first saw you on the West Wing, there's just something that stood out about you. And I've always enjoyed you ever since. You just stand out in the screen, even when you're acting as a Vulcan, no emotion. You can just see <laughs> you a really special human being. And it was really cool to see you on Star Trek as a whippersnapper. That was pretty cool. Um, okay, By the so- way, I turned 30. <laughs> 30 that? on the starship enterprise that's how i spent my 30th birthday that, oh, that's that, really cool man. it that's was that whole week but day one was my 30th birthday let me tell you this before you even mention your question right in the middle of the first take of the day but keep in mind it's my 30th birthday we're in the middle of the first take first thing in the morning we're shooting 7 a.m call time 6 a.m seven cameras are rolling in the middle of the take I see somebody off in the distance. I'm up at the top of the bridge and I see he's whispering. They cut and here comes a guy walking up, coming up toward the top of the bridge. He, he appears to be headed to me. He, he is headed to me. I have no idea what, what's going on. He goes, can, can you do me a favor and just squat down a little bit? I said, sure. He goes, just a little bit lower. And I did. He whips out like a gun from a holster, a thing that on the side of it says dulling spray and proceeds to spray my frigging head. He said, we're getting a bounce of light off of the top of your head. (laughs) I was just beginning to lose my hair. Now I'm okay with it. But you talk about a harsh welcome to a new decade. I have never had anybody spray my head on a set in my life. And he's like, happy birthday, bend over. (laughs) That happened on Star Trek. That's funny. Happy birthday, bend over. (laughs) There's work to do by (laughs) Okay, so my question. What's your question, bud? Thank you for that story. Uh, My question is, is... um, I have a great insight into life. I'm a great teacher. I'm, I'm very good at explaining things. And for years, people have been asking me to write a book. Uh, recently, people, uh, co- many people have been coming to me, asking me to be on radio, asking me to do podcasts. And my kind of response has always been the same. 
Like, I love to talk about things, but I just don't know what you want me to talk about. Like if people were to submit questions, I could write a whole book answering questions. Sure. I just don't know what to talk about. And you coming on this morning going, you know what? I'm just going to jump into questions. And last night somebody came to me and said the same thing. When are you going to start being on radio? And I said, I don't know. I just don't know what to talk about. You coming on today saying, I'm going to go into questions kind of inspired me to ask you. When you get on stage before you go on, how do you know what you're going to talk about? What do you decide? What's your motivating factor? Does it? <laughs> he's, he's asking the right question, isn't he? Yeah. Totally. Greggy. Yeah. So and Fred, from- you taught me how to write a book. I know the structure. Thank you so much for that. I just don't know what I'm supposed to talk about or what topics. So please. See, see, I don't believe that for starters. I don't believe that for you. And I don't believe you're lying. I just think that, that there is another available perspective. Uh, and so when you said, I don't know what to talk about, see, I don't believe you because I believe you, that's the exact opposite truth. I believe you do know what to talk about. I believe that's your truth is that you do know. So technically when we say, I don't know, just really hear me and see if this lands for you. And if it doesn't, then say, Glenn, that doesn't, I don't believe that, that, that doesn't make any sense, but see if when you say, I don't know if what it really means is. I am not living in relationship currently with that place within me that does know. Okay. Because there is a place within you that knows, that knows exactly what Mm -hmm. to do. And every time we keep saying, I don't know, 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 I don't know. We wind up pulverizing our beingness with how much we don't know, which is the very thing that keeps us from knowing. What if instead you just said, I do know, and it's time to dance with it. I really would encourage you to write that down. I do know, and it's time to dance with it. You talk about a life changer. I do know, and it's time to dance with it. Mm-hmm. Meaning, let's take the knowingness onto the dance floor and let's dance, baby. Craig will tell you, I mean, I've been a speaker for many years. I don't use PowerPoint and I don't come up with a plan. But what I come up with are two things, love and trust. That's my talk. Mm-hmm. I love being alive. I love human beings. I trust that this will go exactly the way it needs to go. And the audience will receive what it needs to receive. Now, take me. And, and I'm talking to God when I say that. Take me. Let's go. Let's dance. Get me up on the stage. Let's see what happens. What are you going to talk about? I have no idea. Are you worried about it? Not at all. Mm-hmm. One outcome, inevitably favorable. Reviewed in advance. Instead of, I hope, there you go, Gail. I hope it goes well. I don't hope it goes well. I know it goes well. Mm. So that's available to you, Art. You can know in advance. It not only goes well, it goes perfectly. Mm. Now, hopefully no one's offended by the word shit. And if you are, then I just offended you. But there is a phrase I've been using all 46 years of my career, and it's a three-word phrase that's life-changing. Would you like to hear that phrase? Yes. Yeah. It's not a joke. Before every, every single meeting And I say it loud enough for me to hear, but nobody else to hear. And it's just under my breath. When they used to call my name, because, you know, your name is in the sign-up sheet, the Screen Actors Guild sign-up sheet out in the lobby. And it's the final callback for the West Wing, for example. And they come out and they go, Glenn, as soon as they call me under my breath, I say this. Watch this shit. (laughs) Love it. Watch this shit. (laughs) It sounds cocky, but what you're really doing is you're calling forth your highest available good. And here is why nobody has ever said, watch this shit and then sucked. (laughs) That's never happened. So when you know you're going to do your thing, you can call it up by saying, watch this shit. And it works. Love it. So watch watch this shit is one of my favorite mantras. Let me interject just for a second. Uh, Art, here's a practical thing too. You just said it. Um, You can start doing radio in a podcast 
by just answering questions and that will give you the confidence and you will realize then what you will talk about. You just start asking questions and then once someone asks you a question, you're gonna roll with the question and then you will figure out practically exactly what you can and should be talking about. Yes. Is right, it's there. It's there, you just have yes, to get out. And Craig, this is a yes and, this is huge for all of you that wanna be speakers. Oh, this is so good. It's so good to share this information. So here's the deal. Every moment is informed by and made possible by the previous moment. Mm -hmm. And there's no other access to it. Mm -hmm. So for example, you get up to do a talk. So let's say you start your talk at 11 o'clock. I think Craig brought me up at 1110 or 1115, mm -hmm. something like that today. By the way, Craig, yeah, I have a hard out in, I have to be physically done adios in 20 minutes you got it because i have people here picking me up at the hotel in 30 minutes i understand um so uh so for example i'll give you a, the perfect metaphor for this let's say you are you are driving on a two-lane highway at night the pathway between two small towns at night is dark it's a, it's a rural highway. You don't have lights out there, but you do have headlights. And here's the thing. The whole path is not going to be illuminated all at once. Cause right now, a mile away from me, it's entirely dark. But as I move closer to it, it becomes illuminated. That's how speaking works. You get up, you come from love, you start. You just start. Where do I start? I don't know. Good morning. That's awesome. I think I'd like to just look at everyone, which I've said many times. And then all of a sudden, Roger is there in front of me and I see a smile and I have a reaction. And Roger's smile informs something in me as to what's next. And when we trust the art of what's next, we become amazing speakers, not only amazing speakers, amazing human beings, because we're always trusting that this moment is enough. Please write down this moment is enough. Mm -hmm. And when we really reside in the trust that this moment is enough, one of the gifts this moment gives us is it is always informing us of what's next. And there's no, there's no other pathway to it. So I had no idea why I was doing a show, which most of you never saw, possibly none of you saw. I did a show in Vancouver. We did six episodes, okay, of a series that was canceled on ABC. And then all of a sudden, it was called Strange World, by the way, it was the name of the series, six-part series, designed to be more, but they pulled the plug. The only reason that it was important that I do that series, I made a nice paycheck on it. Great. This is many years ago. This was like 22 years ago. But it was so that I could become aware of a guy named Howard Gordon who could become aware of, of me. Shortly afterward, I'm in L.A., and Howard Gordon calls to ask me to do a series called Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And I'm guest starring on the series. And now our dance is deepened. Right? Our dance is deepened. We're going further. We're not stopping on Strange World. We had a fabulous time. We went to dinner. And a few months later, he was creating a little show called 24. Each moment informing the next. Mm -hmm. I do Strange World. I do Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And then I get seven years on 24, which has opened every door in the world for me. So trusting that this room, for example, right now in this moment, just everybody I would hope recognizes that what's going on in this room right now is informing what's next. So it's not only just being here, it's informing what's next, provided you're open to it. And if you're open to it, you will breathe this in with such joy because you realize this is nothing more than a display of your headlights moving down the road illuminating what's next, illuminating what's next, illuminating what's next. And it keeps doing it all the way until your destination. A little bit at a time. 
that help you, Art? That was fantastic. You know, I uh, a long time ago I had heard that uh, sometimes we need to be given permission uh, just to do something because it empowers us to be given permission. And when you, you started off by saying, "No, you do know," um, that was like, "You're right, I do know," and I just needed to be given permission to recognize that I know. All right. So, and that's it. And then, and then take it to the dance floor. Right, get on the dance floor and dance with what you do know instead of constantly regurgitating the phrase, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And I'm telling, may I speak on behalf of all of you and your life force? Your life force is saying, could you knock that shit off? <laughs> I got that from my minister, by the way. Could you knock <laughs> that shit off? I'm joking. That was sarcasm. Um, so, yeah, but our life spirit is going, God, could you quit pulverizing me? Could you quit trying to tell me how much I don't know? Mm. That's our life force speaking up going, you were designed to know. For those of you who are fans of Jesus, may I give you one of the coolest sayings he ever gave? Yeah. And this applies no matter what your religion is, because it's, a, because it's wise. The saying is wise. I'm not trying to make people Christian because the truth is I don't care what you believe. I love you. I don't. It doesn't matter. It's not, it's not my job. And, I, and I, how dare anybody assume that their position is more significant than somebody else's. Mm -hmm. I have a term for that. It's called spiritual arrogance, mm -hmm. right? A lot of people seem to feel the need to let the world know that they've got their 50-yard line seats booked in heaven. How about you? <laughs> I've got my tickets. Yeah, I'm a ticket holder, so I'm special. You're a sufferer. Yeah, no, I don't think so. And I think God laughs at those people. <laughs> I really do. And I think God says, could you knock that crap off? You're not helping. You're not getting my message of love out through your arrogance and your ticket waving. Stop it. I'm sorry. Did I say that or just think <laughs> it? Sometimes I speak my thoughts. I think you said it. But that's so... What did you say? I, I just, I don't know. I derailed my own train because I, I have such strong feelings about the fact. Oh, yes, the, the quote. So here's the quote. Everyone was just, oh, my God. Oh, my God. You're amazing. Oh, my God. You're such a healer. You, you know everything about love. These were all of his fans, right? And then he had some not so big fans, and those were the people that put him on a cross. But, but the people that were fans that were praising him, Here's what he had to say to them. And please write it down because I didn't make this up, but boy, it bears looking at. He said, these and greater things ye shall do. How did we miss that? I have spoken at many churches and I bring this up in every church I speak in. How did we miss that? That he said, these and greater things, which means all these things you're impressed by, all these things, you're, you're blown away by how I'm being and how I'm showing up. This is Jesus talking, not me, right? You, you love this miracle. You love that. I'm the son of God. You love all of this. Here's my message to you. What you're seeing and more, you will do. And more. That's the key part is the and more. And more, not and less. Everything you're praising me for, you're going to do that and more when you get into your oneness. Mm. It's the greatest message we've ever been given. And Michelangelo, who told us I didn't carve David, I just carved away everything that was not David. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. Just carve away everything that isn't what you want. What do you want most? And then carve away the crap. What do you want most? Get everything else that is contrary to that out of your life, and what will be left is that. So I'm trying to help you, Art, carve away doubt. Mm. I just want to. I just want to help you chip away at your marble of doubt, and just say, let's get away all the doubt, and what you will have left is certainty, because we got the doubt carved away. It's brilliant. Thank you, Michelangelo. I love it. Thank you. You bet. You, I got time for just uh, maybe like two more. Hey, Glenn, this is Woody Blackman from Los Angeles. How you doing, brother? Hey, Woody. Hey, man, I'm really digging what you're saying. Thank you. Um, you know, my very, you know, I live in L.A. I've done acting and 
you know, I'm a, I'm a real estate guy. Uh, I love selling actors. Um, be, the ones that are making it all have this internal light that drives them. And once you tap into it, it's amazing. And Glenn, I have a couple of questions. Sure. One is, do you have a time where you get into a dark place? Um, you know, it could be in the morning. Uh, be, you know, your identity attacks your beingness. And I was just going to wonder and ask you, what do you do? What sort of gymnastics do you do? And then I had one other thought. You know, I'm a recovering alcoholic, and I don't mind non-alcoholics in the meeting. Oh, good. Um, so I feel welcome. Thank you. But I don't like them sharing as alcoholics. And the difference between you and your brother, in my yes. view, as a drunk, uh, recovering drunk, is we go way down. <laughs> we go to drink ourselves to death. Right. And unless you've done that, you ain't an alcoholic. Right. So I, I love the sanctity of our meetings. As do uh, I. And we love guests, uh, but never take the turn of a drunk because we're there to save our lives. Yes. And, and I say that to other listeners because AA and Bill Wilson uh, and Otis and Huxley, Dr. Bob. Was, yeah, and Dr. Bob and all those great old timers uh, did uh, create a legacy of recovery. And we invite the public, but please <laughs> don't make believe you're drunk. You'll fuck it all up. Uh, but anyway, my question. Wait, wait, wait. Did, did you on some level hear any make believe I'm a drunk on my part? I don't quite oh, understand no why you're saying that. Oh, no, no way. I'm just saying for other people, I think the 12 steps are miraculous. Oh, no doubt about it. Please don't come and become an alcoholic in AA uh, because it's very attractive and sexy. Oh, okay. I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. You know, anyway, one of my favorite things they say in, in the program is take what works and leave the rest. I think it's brilliant. I love you, bro. Huh? I, it, let me ask you, what do you do, Glenn? I believe in stacking successes and you've had so many and I've had so many blessings as well. Sure. But, but what is the calisthenic or the practice that you do when you're in your darkest, most fucked up Glenmore hour or place. So I'm admitting something to you. I love you, bro. Which is that my life doesn't go there. I'm admitting that to you. I can't, I can't even remember the time I last had a dark chapter. I've had, I've had times where I was working on stuff but the idea of being consumed with darkness is a foreign experience to me. And I'm not being boastful. I'm admitting the truth. And I stand before you, this group and God in saying that. And, and I will tell you that there is also a why there is a why that's true. That goes well beyond good luck. There is a why. And the reason is that I routinely practice the daily remembrance of who it is I am. So that's the safeguard against it, which is why I don't experience it. So it, it has been said by many a philosopher, and I happen to wholeheartedly agree with what I'm about to say, which is that the vast majority, did I say all? No, I didn't say all. I said the vast majority. The vast majority of problems human beings get into come as a direct result of a momentary lapse in the remembrance of who it is they are mm. and a remembrance of the beauty of the system in which we operate. Oh, that's strong. Mm -hmm. So before you make a rotten decision, just stop. Who am I? What do I stand for? Who am I? What do I stand for? What are my principles? And now, 
Having thought that, the question, what would love do? And invariably, that's what keeps me out of quicksand. And the greatest teacher for me of never wanting to be in quicksand is having had the experience of being in quicksand because I've certainly screwed up and I seem to need to do things on a grand scale. I don't know about you, but when I conduct research, I do it in a big way. So when I screw up, it's a colossal screw up. I don't waste time with little league screw ups. <laughs> I, I go full tilt because I'm an overachiever. So even in screw ups, I overachieve. Thank you, Craig. Can you relate? <laughs> yeah, I can relate. And, and I've shared some of my screw ups with Craig. We're yeah. brothers. You know, yeah. we, we don't, we don't just put on our game face. It's like, but I want to close today by saying this because I heard it. It's a fresh example. And then I want you to ask your second question, but the, I made an observation on set yesterday. Um, when I got out of the van, this is on Ozark. When I got to the set, one of the PAs greeted us as we were stepping out of the van and someone asked them immediately, how are you? And they answered with a laundry list of what had happened that was wrong thus far that day that was their how are you i am so meaning i am my problems i am what has just taken place and i looked and i just smiled and walked away and i thought i am so grateful that that's not how i live my life and if you think about it the vast majority again i did not say everyone but the vast majority of people base their feelings on what's been, not what is. In other words, we choose to feel how we feel in this moment based on our past. And, and we are a choice so we can choose differently. So the reason I'm in a constantly upbeat mood is because I'm choosing based on this moment and my relationship with the man I'm becoming, not the man I've been. Mm. That got me to this point, but I am not my history. I am my interpretation of that history. And I can interpret very well and very healthy. And if you sit around thinking about the son of a bitch you've always been, and I don't mean you, Woody, I mean any of us, you are going to ruin the precious gift of this moment mm. and of today. So... I am present and grateful in this moment, and I absolutely love that my decisions today and moving forward, the decisions I make today are in a congruent dance with my desired future. I don't do incongruent things, not anymore, because I realize that incongruency does not belong in my life. I am a man of my word, and my word matters mm -hmm. big time. I don't know how many years it's been since I told a lie. I'm not being boastful. I'm being impeccable with my word. Mm -hmm. And I, I, mean, I mean, even the little lies. So what is an example of a little lie? I'm stuck in traffic. Bullshit. You left your house late. <laughs> Bullshit. <laughs> right? Yeah. So once you practice ownership, you stop telling lies. Yeah. Right. I'm stuck in, you're not stuck in traffic. You should have left your house 30 minutes ago. You didn't. So now you're going to make sure they don't think you're a shithead. So you blame it on traffic. <laughs> right. Well, and this whole idea of dodging responsibility at a vibrational being a vibrational level, it deteriorates our beingness. Mm -hmm. Martin Sheen is the man in my life more than my own dad. Martin Sheen is the man who taught me that if your word has no meaning, you have no value. Mm. I learned that from Martin Sheen. You're only as valuable as your word. And Martin Sheen told me, I will do your dad's video. My dad was dying at the time and we made him a birthday video. And I had all these celebrities that were in the video and they were not just wishing him a happy birthday. They were talking shit about his life. I remember that video. Yes. I gave them all insights, very private, naughty insights to my dad's life. And all these celebrities were talking about it as though it were common knowledge in the world. And he's never laughed harder in his life than when he watched this video. And he was dying at the time. Mm. So I asked Martin, would he do the video? And he said, absolutely. Along with John Spencer, God rest his soul. And Martin 
was not available that whole day and I had to leave town the next morning. So clearly at the end of the day, we're not going to get this. We're not going to get him in the video. It's eight o'clock at night and I watched them sign Martin out and I worked until 9 p.m. on the West Wing. Martin left an hour ago. I walk outside of the stage door. Martin is sitting there in his truck and he goes, hey, Glenn, are we going to shoot this thing or what? Wow. He had left an hour earlier and was waiting. Why? To keep his word. And I said, you, you waited? And I began crying because I realized Martin's going to be in this. I don't even have a budget for it. My cost to have Martin Sheen work free, <laughs> free. He was making $300,000 an episode at that time. My cost to have Martin free. Why does he do it? Heart. Mm. Oneness of the heart. Martin and I were friends and are friends today. But it's just such a beautiful story that he said, and then he added, I said, you stayed? Here was Martin's response. He said, Glenn, I gave you my word. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Our word is everything. What was your other question, Woody? Uh, my other question is, uh, when are you going to buy a house for me in L.A.? <laughs> um, let's go with never. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and check the never box on that. Glenn, how do you like Texas? I'm in love with Texas. Me too. <laughs> Craigie gets it. Why I'm in love. No, we're very happy in Dallas. And uh, the only way I would return to LA is if a series takes me there where I need to be based up there. for you, boss. <laughs> yeah. So that, that, that's it. We're very, cause I love the fact that we're in the middle of the country and I can go yeah. East or West that helps a lot with, with ease, you know, and the so commute Glenn, to have... Atlanta is easy and I got to go Craig. Cause I was going to say, you got to go. I'm looking at the time. Yeah. They're picking me up in 10 minutes and I want to go brush my teeth and be okay. ready. Um, Glenn, hey, listen, love to all of so you. Much. Thank you so much. You're so awesome to do this. We had the most people on we've ever had on a phone call. That's a tribute to your heart and, and your give your uh, give back. So thank you. Oh, thanks. I want to read some of these comments. I haven't even been oh, looking there's at so the, many. Dude. I haven't even been looking at the chat. There's so many. But listen, not only would I say God bless all of you, what I will say is God blesses all of you. Mm. Right? So yeah. that's not a request. That's an already done. All of you are blessed people, and I would just invite you to participate in that certainty. Just participate in that certainty. And Craigie, you know I love you I dearly. Love you too, Glenn, dearly. And I'm grateful to have this time with you Thank guys. You, we'll man. talk soon. Sounds good. Love you, buddy. Bye, bud. Safe trip hey. today. Hello. Thank you. Tell Jason I said hi. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> All right. Well, there you go, folks. There's Glenn Moore Shower brought to you by uh, uh, the Rock Your Life Wednesday Speaker Series. Um, thank you guys for um, um, tuning in today. And this will be up. I'll try to get this one up today because I want to put it out there because, wow, great information as usual. And he'll be at my October event as well. So you get to see him. Wow. What a morning, Bye. Greg. Yeah, good morning. Wow, what a morning. Today was a good day. Uh, and it's only it's only 11.52. Notes. <laughs> I know. I yeah. I took a lot of notes too. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Greg, awesome. can I ask you a question? Sure. Uh there was uh I, I for, it's a little early in the morning for me. Uh but one of your uh one of our alumni one of the people in our workshop yep. uh, did an extensive list on uh, on uh, doing, you know, buying podcast equipment. And my assistant tried to get it. And do you charge $20 for each re replay of your show? Or I God told no. her. God, no, no, no. I don't charge a thing. It's on our membership site. So uh, I've sent the membership site. Uh, do you need me to resend the link to you? Uh, well, I'm on your Facebook. Uh, no, no, it's not on Facebook. It's on our. It's on my Kartra page membership site. Uh, if you would, that I'll send it again. Fabulous. Yeah, there's no I'm more. Waiting, charge. <laughs> I'm waiting to go shopping, and I need to see this guy's okay. report. So it'll be listed podcast uh, thing. So I'll send you the link again as soon as we're done with this. Thank you, bro. You're very welcome. So I just want to share. This is this is once again. This is my um, this is my shameless plug. Here it is. Lollapalooza. Here's the lineup: Foo Fighters, Post Malone, Tyler the Creator, Miley Cyrus. And look down here at the bottom. 
Oh, wait, wait, wait. Look at it. Here it is. My son's band, Otto, is playing Lollapalooza. That's just <laughs> exciting. And then, and then we have uh, clear, clear old drawings. And then we have, oh, stop, stop, stop. Then we have this one. This is the next one. Come on. This one. And here is. And here, down here, is Otto again. It was down there with Guns N' Roses for Bottle Rock. I just, I seeing this in print is like the coolest thing. Now, I know they're on the bottom, but they got to start somewhere, right? Yeah. <laughs> and it's just so exciting to see this. So there's Otto here, and there's Otto there with the three Ts. I'm just beside myself. Greg, they're yes. on it. They're on it. Look at that. Guns and Roses right there. And then, uh, wait. stop, stop, stop. I don't even know how to work this thing. Anyway, you see it. it it's a, it's a, and then Post Malone and Foo Fighters on the other one. And it's so exciting. Limp Biscuits playing, Miley Cyrus. It's going to be amazing. So I'm going. I'm, I'm going to both of them. I'll see you all there. Great. Are you going to get us tickets, special tickets to go with you in uh, Chicago? I, I, I get four tickets. So that's unfortunately my family. So I think tickets are expensive. It's like $800 for the weekend because uh, you get to go to all four days. So it's pretty expensive, but they sell out. It's going to be like uh, like 500,000 people at Lollapalooza. Yeah. And you're going to do videos? You're going to do videos from the, from, from the event so we well, can they, see it? They do it. Uh, but yeah. yeah, I'll be, I'll be, are you kidding? I'll hire a film crew or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it'll be, uh, it'll be quite, uh, quite a, oh, it's just a, a exciting, beyond exciting. Mm. I love right, your I'm proud gonna, papa moments, Craig. Those I know, awesome. I know. I'm I love very them. proud, very, all these things are going through my head. All right, so this uh, is a long one. South Sorry. by Southwest, Craig, South by Southwest, your, your son's band, are they going to play there? I don't know. So the, the this like Lollapalooza was just uh, announced this morning at ten o'clock. I knew two days ago, and then uh, Bottle Rock, same thing. And the interesting thing about Bottle Rock, um, another band is playing with Otto in the same stage as Otto uh, is Slash's son. London is in a band called Saint Electric, and they're playing on the bottleneck with Otto and Guns N' Roses. So. I'll have a reunion with uh, Slash, and anyway, it's just going to be a, an amazing weekend. Uh, no, I, these are the only two I know about, and they're the ones that are saying we're opening it up, and this is in Chicago and Los Angeles. So if they're opening up, the rest of the um, South by Southwest, I'm sure, will be huge again. I think just, it's just going to open. Uh, in September, Bottle Rock, also the Village people are playing. I'm excited about that. I <laughs> just want to see the Village people. So anyway, it's going to be uh, quite uh, an experience. All right. Um, yeah, I'll keep you posted on the more they get. You know, this will open a lot of doors, obviously. So are you going to wear your pink jacket? Uh, if I could, if I lose like uh, 10 more pounds, I think I could fit in the pink jacket. But yeah. no, I will not be wearing it. At that. It's like full circle there, you know? I know. Axel will be like, I remember that. I remember that. All right. I'm cutting out. I'm going. Now I have to go to see my son's in my son's school. I have to, he's being inducted into the theater hall of fame or something. So I'm going to that. All right. Love you guys. Thank you, Craig. Big hug. See you Bye. next week. See you guys. Thank see you. You. Bye. I'll see live people next week. No classes Monday and Wednesday, but I'll see live people in LA on Tuesday and I'll email you. Bye. 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 Awesome Bye. job.